Hi everyone, welcome to Brooks River in Katmai National Park, Alaska. I always love sharing this experience with everybody, watching brown bears fishing for salmon at one of the most beautiful uh, and wild national parks you're gonna find in the entire world. My name is Mike Fitz with explore.org and we're looking at live footage right now of a brown bear meandering through uh, Brooks River. We're here to talk about brown bears and salmon today and a bunch of other things because I have uh, not one but two co-hosts along with the ride with me. Uh, first, let me introduce Katmai National Park Ranger Naomi Boak. Naomi, great to have you here today and congratulations on a successful Fat Bear Week. Oh, and congratulations to everyone in Explorer. We we can't do Fat Bear Week without you and the Conservancy, so um, very happy to be here. And we're also joined by a special guest today uh, who is a gigantic brown bear fan and maybe the biggest, one of the biggest Otis fans around in the world, uh, who explored org's founder, Charlie Annenberg. Charlie, great to have you uh, in the conversation today. I think we're gonna have plenty to talk about. Oh, it's always great to be here. So hi, Mike, hi, Naomi, and to all the fans who are joining in, thank you so much. Let's talk bears. Yeah, and while this bear is moving out of our line of sight, uh, Naomi, do you recognize this one? This is a chubby bear. That one had a really I good know. year. I, I don't recognize it. Charlie going to put you to the test. <laughs> you guys are the masters of the number system. I'm better with the nicknames. I have to be honest with you. So I, I'm not sure. I mean, so many bears have, I feel like, have come in um, this late season. I've seen a few up in Dumpling and all abouts and it's just really nice because all of them look very healthy and rotund. Yeah, lots of fat bears. It's, it's great. It's, it's not it's surprising, too, to see bears at this time of the year that we don't recognize because there's a lot that are moving through. Um, they're, it's a little early for them to disperse to their denning sites, but a lot, there's a lot of late season bears that maybe just kind of like show up for a few days and they continue to pass on through. Uh, or we just don't see that much during the summertime. Um, and if, if a bear was here in July and then it just is coming back now, it's going to look a lot different <laughs> than when it was in its lean um, season. Let's uh, introduce uh, some of the cameras available to us today. Uh, we have, of course, the main Brooks Falls camera, which we're looking at right now. We also have uh, the Falls Low camera, which is located almost not quite directly below the Falls cam, but close to it, at, giving us a bear's eye view of the river. The Riffles cam is uh, still live as well. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have cams at the lower river um, right now, uh, but we do have the camera up on Dumpling Mountain. So this is a, a beautiful live image of Katmai's uh, wild landscape, snow on the high mountains. So those are our cameras at our disposal uh, today to give you uh, maybe a closer look at where they happen to be located. I know we always have a few new viewers joining us and maybe if you just learned about Katmai through Fat Bear Week, let's take a look at where Brooks River is in Katmai National Park. It's about 300 miles southwest of Anchorage, Alaska. And Brooks River is fairly short. It's only about a mile and a half long. So less than three kilometers in length and it's bisected by Brooks Falls. This view, it flows generally from left to right and along with our webcam partner, the National Park Service Explorer Org hosts and maintains several webcams at Brooks River. The signal from those webcams is uh, sent to the top of Dumpling Mountain and hopped up and over a couple of radio repeaters to the small town of King Salmon, about 30 miles away, or they're sent directly uh, to the world through a satellite uplink uh, connect or internet connection. We'll uh, take a look at uh, the cameras that we have available to us today too, just to give you an idea of where they are located specifically, the Brooks Falls camera, again, looking right at Brooks Falls and occasionally it'll look downstream for a couple of hundred yards or so. So we have some good opportunities to see bears throughout that portion of the river. The Riffles camera is located about a hundred yards downstream of Brooks Falls and it looks across the river and up to the falls itself. So those are our main cameras that we'll be looking at uh, today. We're going to try to answer some viewer questions that were submitted in advance. We don't, uh, won't be looking at the comments uh, as they're coming in live, but we did uh, gather some audience questions in advance. And this week, it's still an opportunity for you to donate to the Otis Fund if you want to help contribute to the uh, conservation of Katmai National Park. 
The Otis Fund through the Cat My Conservancy is a great way to do that. We're running a, a fundraiser right now in Explorador.org is being uh, generous in matching uh, donations to the Otis Fund uh, this week. And if you want to learn more about that, go to catmyconservancy.org. Uh, All right. And uh, let's head back to live footage right now. Uh, it looks like from what I can see, uh, the river is kind of quiet right now, which wrong. Naomi is, is not... <laughs> it's not uncommon at, at this time of the year. Yeah, no, it's, um, I mean, if we see some bears tonight, I'll be very excited. We, of course, we saw bears before we started and they left because they knew we were coming. <laughs> so what would be the, the reason why, you know, we're seeing fewer bears now versus like just a, a week and a half ago? Well, I mean, their metabol metabolism is beginning to slow down. Right. Um, and it, there are fewer dead fish available to them. And, uh, and as they slow down, they're just going to start looking for a place to den and, uh, and we're not going to see them on the river. And let's turn up, uh, upstream here to our falls low camera, which is, which is looking downstream. Charlie, I know that you wanted to talk about um, a longtime camera operator who unfortunately passed away earlier uh, this year. And a lot of the really remarkable views and moments that we've had on the Bear Cams on Exploited Org is, is, uh, or was brought to us by her. Yeah, this, I think for all the fans, at least, and I'm speaking for myself, it's been a very unusual season. Um, and it really began even before Brooks Falls when our beloved Catherine, um, Catherine, for those who don't know her, she was the heart and soul of Explore. And she created all the camera angles, trained all the cam operators. She was the most passionate person I knew about Explore. I mean, you, this woman would text me in any hour of the night watching every camera. But the bears were her, her jewel. And, um, she passed right before season. Yesterday was actually her birthday. And uh, really that's why one of the cams now, we call Cat's Cam, I believe. It's in honor of her. Um, but she was a spirit of explorer and uh, she's really, you know, she channels all the energy of these cameras to this day. And to all of us that did know her, I mean, I, I, it's, it's a loss that you, you can't replace. Um, it was really special and, and, uh, I know she's looking down right now and, uh, it was, I just wanted to really give her a shout out and mention that because she was the true heart and soul of explore.org and to all these animals. Yeah, she really yeah. did love the brown bears. It was, um, you know, she was, and she was there from the beginning of bear cam. I think I remember when I was still a ranger at, at Katmai. Um, you know, Ranger Roy and I would, would uh, contact her frequently talking about the cameras and, you know, where bears might be. Um, and that knowledge, that tradition that sort of she helped to set up is now being passed on to other camera operators who are helping us to get like great views um, like this looking down river of a bear searching for some of the last salmon along the river uh, this year. Yeah. It's uh, so really it's a, a tribute as well to all the bears, but this season and this whole year for the Explore team has been a tribute to Catherine. Um, we miss her, love her, and uh, I hope she's looking down right now and smiling at Grazer and the rest of the bears down there. I think she would have predicted Grazer this year. <laughs> that would have been a good choice. <laughs> I, and it was uh, interesting to me that I, I endorsed Grazer in Fat Bear Week this year, but uh, I didn't pick her to win. I thought Chunk would win. Um, so I got one of those things. Uh, neither one of those things right, actually, now that, now that I think about it. Uh, this bear that we're looking at downriver right now, um, looking really healthy for this time of the year. Uh, from this distance, you know, I'm not... 100% sure on who it might be. This bear does give me a sort of like a, 
a 504 vibe though. Um, I'm wondering if this could be 821 Naomi. It has that scar uh, on uh, its right uh, hip there. And um, you know, if, it, if there's a bear with a scar on its right hip that, ha that has like a 504 face, which is a, if you're not familiar with her, she's an adult female that uses Brooks River, that points me to thinking that it, this could be 821. And that's that's what I was thinking too. Um, was my first thought eight two one and um, and he should look that fat because he did a lot of fishing on the lip this this season. Yeah, and he's grown a lot too. Um, so he was a bear that was raised along the river. We saw him as a cub. His mother still uses the river. Um, in fact, I think 504 was maybe on the cameras not long before we went live today. Hopefully she'll show back up and we'll get a look at her. Uh, when, I'm, when I'm looking at brown bears, I can oft, if, if there's a, a we, we don't you always know who like a bear's mother is once they separate, um, you know, once, once bear families separate. But if you have a good idea of who like that, that young bear or that young adult might be, um, and who their mother might be. Often you can see sort of like resemblances, physical resemblances between mother and offspring. And I think I can see that in um, 821 and 831, who's suspected to be um, his sibling from the, from the same letter. I, if we had more information about like who who's the fathers of these bears were, I think we would be able to see the physical characteristics of, um, of the fathers in these bears too. Yes, we do speculate about the dads. Right now, that's about yeah. uh, as much as we can do is, is speculate on their um, their paternal uh, line. Uh, but yeah, we, we know that many mother bears come back to Brooks River and there are legacy, long uh, mat matrilineal legacies and lineages at at Brooks River. So, you know, 812 here is just part of yeah. that. Um, and Charlie, that's also something that I, th I, th I found, you know, that, um, that I, one of the stories that I saw this summer at Brooks River was sort of like those continuing stories of the matra lines along Brooks River. You know, we, 901, she came back with cubs this year. And, um, and she's part of a, of a line that I don't know how into long ago into the past this line extends at brooks river but her grandmother is still using brooks river that's um 708 and uh who's nicknamed amelia and amelia has been on the cameras a lot uh this year i mean i think that's what makes these cameras so unique is we've been i think live now 11 years and we've witnessed generations now kind of growing up and passing of the guard it it's so unique. Uh, there were some rumors going that maybe 747 was courting Grazer earlier this season. So I'll be very curious to see if we see some offspring from the queen herself and new reigning champ. Uh, you know, you've been wearing her t-shirt right now. I, it's so, it, it's so unique. Um, we're kind of watching generational passing of the torch. I think we saw it this season uh just in the size of some of the the bears i mean 747 who's to me the most impressive bear i've come across was actually i thought chunk and walker and even 605 are now maybe growing to be as big if not bigger so it's really interesting to observe the the process here for me you know, also if you if you watching the cams over the years um, and for me, I'm always fascinated by the behaviors, whether I'm watching on the cams or I'm at Brooks. And I look at the 409 lineage and to see 909 and 910 and their offspring, and then to see their behaviors, when you see them all on the lip, it harkens back to bead nose and, and how she was a champion of lip fishing. And um, and they've just passed that down through the generations, and and you get that through the cams because we've been able to watch those generations um, grow up. 
Yeah, and, and speaking of that, Naomi, um, I think our Falls Low camera right now, you get a glimpse of this. I know our camera operators are working really hard to find bears, but that rock on the left-hand side, I think that <laughs> that's a memorable rock for a lot of people, including you. And if we want to talk about bears with a lineage along Brooks River, we can talk about Bear 435 Holly and then her, uh, her sons and, and daughters, uh, especially number 89 Backpack, who I know that you – took a strong interest in in the, the first days that you were watching bear camp. Yeah, um, that backpack rock, backpacks rock. Um, back in 2014, I, I was really sick and somehow, somehow I found the cams and there was backpack, this big fat Buddha like bear sitting on that rock. And then I was just addicted. That was it. Um, and when I first got to Brooks in 2019, one of the first things I did was go to the falls and take a picture of that rock. So, um, just, yeah. empty, just an empty rock. It, well, it was an empty rock because it was uh, May. So, okay. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, Holly produces really great offspring and, um, backpack was around a lot this year. Um, and unfortunately he came back fat a little later than we were there. So he didn't make it into the bracket, but, um, you know, Holly, yeah, that's more generations of Holly's bears too. And she is a great bear. You know, backpack was sitting on that rock about this week. I took a photo of it and even a video feed. I think I posted it on social media. So it's interesting to have their spots. You know, like their little sweet spots. He was looking really big, just completely laying on it, taking a nap. Mm -hmm. It was unique. I thought we were just that. It was a few days ago. Yeah, I saw that. I mean, it just, they just, you know, they draw you in. And um, so it's, I mean, it's thrilling to see the bears that you follow, like when 503 came back in the fall. Um, there were a lot of happy people when we saw 503. Yeah, we had not seen him all summer. And uh, I know people were wondering about his whereabouts. And the bears at Brooks River are not collared or tagged in any way. So we don't know where they go uh, when they're not at the river. Occasionally, someone will see a recognizable bear at like a different salmon stream. But that's pretty uncommon. Most of the time, we don't have really any idea where they're at other than they're just out there wandering along the landscape or fishing in a different place um so so when we when we see a bear return after it's been absent for a while uh it's life is you know still largely mysterious but it's great to see those bears return looking healthy and i as we get a better look at this bear this is a big guy down here um bigger than a21 who we're looking at before i think this is a 151 uh, i know he was at the falls earlier before the broadcast he walked downstream Hopefully he'll slowly make his way back up to the falls, but you can see he has a, he's a big guy. <laughs> he had a really good year. He's one of those bears that has been uh, acting more dominant the last several years. Um, you know, we just a few moments ago, we were talking about like lineages and bears raised along the river and uh, Walker here. He was a bear that experienced the river as uh, as a cub with his mom. And when he was a, uh, a sub adult and a young adult, he was uh, fairly playful and fairly tolerant of other bears, but that's not the behavior we see him in him anymore. He's gorgeous. Wow. Look at that yeah. sunlight. I love how their coats become so shiny in fall. The, the, from the coys in the South to the big, I mean, they're, they're just, they look so healthy right now. Look at them stunning in that light. Yeah. Hmm. And a tribute. Gut. <laughs> and a tribute to Walker, too, because um, usually in the last few years, he will fish on the lip very successfully. But there haven't been as many fish jumping the falls this year. So he didn't spend a lot of time there, there but he still got enormous. Mm -hmm. Look at him. Now take a nap there, boy. <laughs> Looks like he was going to say. He's really... Quite as he's he's definitely gorgeous. Mike, I have a question. Um, I have a memory of Walker being being one of those bears who stays fairly late 
at Brooks River. Yeah, you know, I can't remember off the top of my head. We we have really good information on like the dates of first arrival for the individual bears, but the date that they're last seen is something that you know, we maybe have some evidence from people who watch the bear cams, but it's not collected systematically systematically. Uh, I would not be surprised if he sticks around longer. Uh, this year, it you know, at least more cons most conspicuously, it seems like we're seeing a lot of family groups around right now. And I wonder if that's because, you know, they, oh, in total, like bear families just have like a higher level of energetic needs, maybe to put on uh, fat before they go into the den. You know, Walker, he's just like, you know, he doesn't have to worry about anybody uh, but himself. Um, but a bear like Amelia, uh, who the camera operators are saying, um, may be visible to us pretty soon on one of the cameras. So I'm going to be looking for her, but yeah, you know, sh she has to work a lot harder to feed herself and her cubs. Oh, there they are. Let's cut to the riffles right now. They're heading oh, yeah. upstream towards the fall. I mean, it's just extraordinary. We get to look at this it, it never gets old. I mean, come on, look at this, the whole family. Oh, look at that cub. Oh my God. I mean, Every day, I'm see, uh, it just amazes me. You are the biggest fan, Charlie. Well, it's not even a fan. We're looking at magic. I mean, this is nature's cathedral. Yeah. This is a pearl of the planet. I mean, this is sacred. It's, 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 I mean, the fact, we're all sitting in Alaska right now looking at these incredible, yeah, I guess I, I'm, I'm up there. There's some pretty big fans. I read the comments, but. It, it ceases to amaze me. I, I, I marvel at it. Like, you know, we just went from Walker. I saw Otis earlier, you know, you have Grazer and look, I mean, three, three little cubs and Amelia. I, I mean, I'm so happy that they've been safe. I mean, it's been a difficult season with some of the, as we know, cubs. So to see her with their three and it's just it's so magical. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we should all take a good look at her because when she came back in September, and I saw her, I was, she created a two hour bear jam in, in July when I saw her. Um, but then when she came back, I did not recognize her. She was so thin and I, I just couldn't believe that that was Amelia. Um, but she still had September and October to get fat and she did it. And her cubs look great. I mean, these bears have a lot to teach us about resilience and patience. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. In fact, we had a, an audience question that was along those lines, Naomi, something that you just brought up. Um, somebody was wondering how, how have Otis and some of the moms and subadults put them put on enough weight or enough fat reserves to survive the winter. Um, I know you've said th that they have enough, but do you mean every bear and i you know i can't speak to every bear of course um but yeah like you were talking about naomi when we when we first saw amelia here come back a few weeks ago in late summer i didn't recognize her at first i, I think we talked about this in one of the previous play-by-plays maybe it was also a little bit of denial on, on my end because i didn't she was quite thin for that time of the year um which was hard for me to watch because amelia is one of the first bears that I got to know when I was working at, at Katmai a number of years ago. Uh, but you can see that she still has three cubs. Her cubs look very healthy for this time of the year. She's gained a lot of body mass over the last few weeks. So this, this, um, this is a display of her skill, her resilience, her ability to be patient and protect her, her cubs at the same time, which is a really hard chore. She's the only mother on the river uh, this year that we saw with three cubs in July and still has three cubs at this time of year. Yeah, and and um, spending time with her in that bear jam, um, she had a lot of work to do with those cubs because they were very active and very playful and running all over the place. So um, no wonder that she, you know, had to work very hard this summer. And there's another bear coming into the frame right now. So uh, uh, Amelia might avoid those. She might move out of our um, 
our line of sight as this bear kind of walks upstream. That's a strategy that mother bears employ all the time. Uh, you know, and even grazer will do it. It's, it's avoidance. It's like, Hey, if there's, looks like maybe there's going to be a risk to my cubs. I'm just going to get out of the way. Not to say that this bear is threatening her cubs, but sometimes mother bears uh, just do that as a preemptive measure to keep their, their cubs safe. Uh, and back to this, this question, um, you know, on average, when I'm looking at the bears at, at Brooks River, including Otis, it does look like um, even though there were fewer <laughs> salmon um, swimming into the watershed this year, they definitely have enough fat reserves to get through hibernation. There are many other things that, and challenges that they have to deal with, like illness and disease and broken bones, and just like the, the, the rigors of age. So it's just not fat reserves that affect their overwinter survival. But on average, yeah, I think they are doing quite, quite well um, this year. And it was a challenging himself. year. Yeah. Look at that. Giving himself a little butt rub. I love it. <laughs> Set up to the falls real quick. That bear, yeah, enjoying a scratch for just a moment. But this bear catching himself a meal. Gee, you know who that is, Mike? Is this five? Is this five zero three? I think so. Or is this um, okay? Uh, yeah, catching a sockeye salmon, spawned out sockeye salmon. Um, you can look how that was. That's a salmon worked extraordinarily hard. Um, you know, we celebrate the success of the bears, but you know that salmon, even though it's getting devoured by a brown bear, that is a triumphant salmon. Um, at this time of the year, a salmon with pale flesh like that indicates that it has already spawned successfully um and uh you know it now it's you know its energy is is uh being recycled back into the ecosystem um through this uh this this brown bear here Amy, do you want to like remind we... me sorry go ahead charlie well, I, I, it feels I, for me, it's been a very late season in that I felt like the salmon spawning and the runs late. And actually, I feel like a lot of bears being this time of year are still there and they're still eating. I mean, it's just I feel like I mean, I, I thought it's rare in October that you see bears up by brooks eating like this, like right here. I'm just curious. Have, have you noticed that? I mean, is it maybe just a later season because it started later? That's Rose. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. I, uh, I think the the timing of the salmon spawning season isn't necessarily as um, impacted by when they arrive, um, because it's it's really kind of like water temperatures that dictate when they um, when they spawn. Uh, and, and spawning in Brooks River is delayed compared to a lot of the headwater streams in the area because of the uh the lake that feeds brooks river so the water coming out of the lake is just a little bit warmer than like a spring fed stream for instance so salmon spawn in brooks river just a little bit later in the year and it, every year is a little is is going to be different so it's hard to say some years though there have been you know bears fishing at the falls more consistently than we've seen this year if there's like a strong coho salmon run and there didn't seem to be like a really large coho salmon run this year. So that can influence it for sure. Um, is we're, I think we can expect to see fewer and fewer bears um, over the next couple of weeks. Like, so if we tune in to the cameras, you know, this time next week, probably, you know, if we count the number of individual bears, I bet we'll see, we see fewer of them uh, next week overall. Okay. And there is uh, on the right hand side, yeah, is um, Amelia again. So she didn't really move very far. She just kind of moved out of our line of sight for the moment. Now she's back in the in the water. She actually, um, I can cut to a clip here of her from um, just a few days ago. She was in this same position. We want to talk about bears as creatures of habit. 
uh, just a few days ago, she basically did the exact same thing on the uh, on that log. And she was, uh, in, eventually in this clip, you'll see her get into the water um, and just grab a salmon and all of her cubs immediately sense this opportunity. Of course, Amelia's not gonna wait for them. The cubs are gonna have to come out and take fish from her. <laughs> but uh, the <laughs> cubs are also experiencing that hyperphagia right now, like the adult bears. So they feel this tremendous hunger to get fat before winter. So Mike, is that a place where um, logically the, the spawned out salmon would get caught with that tree? It might be. Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised because you know, as the salmon drift downstream, after as they start to die, um, yeah, you know, obstructions in the water like logs and down trees, uh, those are going to catch salmon. And even though like a, a down tree and a log or you know, a, something like that is going to shift from year to year, the positions of those, we see bears kind of checking those out. So I wonder if bears. It seems like they can recognize. Hey, this is similar to a spot that I found food before, I'm going to check this out again. I'm going to poke my nose under the water. I'm going to see if there's a salmon caught in that, in that place. I mean, you talk about, you know, her, her behaviors and going back to the same place. And frequently for me, um, behaviors help me recognize a bear almost more than anything. We're looking back now at live footage from the falls, or excuse me, from the Riffles camera looking towards the falls. Three adult bears in our view. I think Amelia's cubs are on the left-hand side hiding in the shadow under the spruce tree. So we'll see as, as this bear kind of wanders in Amelia's direction, uh, see how she responds. I think, you know, kind of, again, moving just slightly out of the way like that is just a real subtle avoidance response from her. And, and, and seeing bears shifting around like this at this time of the year is, is very common uh, because the salmon aren't necessarily gathered in any place in high numbers. And I think that I think that's 821 there, Naomi, on the right-hand side. I thought I got a look at it, Scar, as he was moving downstream. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, Amelia would want to necessarily, she wouldn't want to you know push the envelope with a bear as big as 821 in the vicinity. And he has gotten big. Huh. I'm getting homesick, Mike. It looks beautiful. It's like it would be a very beautiful day uh, to be there uh, with all of these fat, glossy bears along the river in a great light. Charlie, you were talking about that earlier, about how beautiful it is to watch the bears at this time of the year. It's It's a different viewing experience i think I, i'd be interested to know your thoughts on this charlie uh, different viewing experience at this time of the year because the the falls to me in july that's a more competitive time for the bears it seems like uh not only do they look a bit more haggard because they're shedding and they're uh they haven't had a lot of good meals by that time of the year so they're very hungry uh this time of the year it's just a it's a different dynamic although there's still conflict and competition between the bears uh I, I wonder if you, if you see a difference or if you experience the bears through the cameras in, in different ways, depending on the time of the year. Well, the fall foliage and the coloration of the bears is so magnificent. I think it starts to look a lot more like a painting. Um, in July, especially this July, it was a rough beginning of the season. And I mean, most of the bears like beat up and bruised and it truly was a survival of the fittest story. I mean, it was not, it was this, this season in particular. And so it's still uh, stunningly beautiful, but if you were to even read the fans comments, especially this season, there was Otis not showing up. The, 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 it was a very interesting salmon run this year. It could just be that we've been spoiled for many years with such an abundance early. So it was a completely different thing. And now it's, you know, the, the bears have become somewhat Zen as you see right now. I mean, here again, we have feeding with, Amelia and her babies and it's like they've slowed down and everything's kind of it feels more of a painting um but equally stunning I mean look what we're looking at right here I mean imagine I always like to say if any of us were taking a hike 
All right, you are, and you saw this. I mean, look at the color of these bears and the, the, the light today. And that's what I mean. The season's been interesting. It was kind of a long winter. And I'm just curious if fall is going to be a little different because looking at the history of the photographs I collect and the clips, there are already snowstorms that have usually come in in October. And I have shots of Otis walking through fog and snowstorms. And this is just a stunning day today. You know, but I love the coats. I mean, they're so thick and the coloration is so magnificent. And we're getting, getting yeah. to see uh, differences in the coloration of the cubs as well at this time of the year. When first year cubs like these show up in uh, July, there is subtle differences in their coloration, especially if, if one of them has like a natal collar around their neck of light colored fur. But at this time of the year, those differences are much more dramatic. So it's not only like body size between the cubs, but also their colors that help us to tell them apart. And then we get to see differences in in their um, their personalities and dis dispositions developing and becoming uh, apparent at this time of the year. Like there was only, you know, it can depend on how well fed they are. Um, but And I know, Naomi, you have seen this, but uh, some cubs are much more bold than others. And there was only one cub that came out uh, to greet or to, to try to pull <clears throat> fish away from mother in that instance, not all three, like we saw in that recorded clip a few minutes ago. Yeah. I mean, that's another thing that, you know, you get to watch over the years on the cams. Um, uh, I think it was when Grazer's cubs were um, yearlings, one of them uh, bit Grazer on the butt. <laughs> the other one didn't do that. They're very different personalities. I mean, you know, if I were a cub, I wouldn't bite Grazer on the butt. <laughs> um, but, you know, also 8, 806 Junior, after all the traumatic things that that cub went through this year, it became a very bold cub at the end of the year. So I, I love watching the cubs' personalities develop. You also, if you look at like this scene right here, when it calms down, you kind of see the cubs uh, take on their own independence. It's like they're learning how to kind of fish on their own right now. You, you know, it's not as rough. Look how much calmer the water is now than in July. And they kind of roam a little bit. Obviously, they stay close to mom. But I've just noticed that a lot in the fan snapshots. The, the cubs just, you know, look at right now, they're just roaming and saying, look, mom, I can do it on my own. I'm growing, you know, learning <laughs> independence skills. It's like a training school right now. Look at her standing. Oh my God! Look at yeah. yeah that's a that's yeah. a characteristic Amelia thing to do. Uh, lots of bears stand yeah. on their hind legs, but Amelia she'll stand up. Um, she'll walk on her hind legs for short distances. That's one of the behavioral characteristics I've learned to use to recognize her. Her um, one of her offspring, uh, two eighty four, will do that as well. Um, and they they can look an awful lot alike. So uh, sometimes you can't confuse them. Uh, from one another but that's one of the behaviors that i assign to or i that i recognize amelia by is standing up on her hind legs and walking a few paces me too i i it's um it's a behavior i look for in her as well and speaking of 284 she looked great this year um she she was in fat bear week Yes, yes, she was. Um, and uh, we're going to, I think, maybe talk about that for a week just briefly before uh, we conclude uh, the broadcast. I considered talking about it earlier, but then the Cubs showed up and the families and other bears. So we haven't had really a, a good lull in the action since then. Uh, but yeah, uh, great, ex great example here of, of a Cub, you know, growing in independence. Uh, at the beginning of summer, that cub would not have wanted to leave mother's side. It would have, even if, if mom left it on the bank and went out into the river to fish, that would have been probably pretty stressful for it. Um, but even first year cubs gain a lot of confidence and independence from the beginning of summer to the, to the end of summer. Yeah, that cub is just eating away. It's not even looking towards mom. They don't have all of their teeth yet either. So they do, uh, it, it takes a while. I, I don't know 
off the top of my head specifically, you know, when their their full set of teeth erupt. Um, but at this life stage, I don't think they have all of them. Um, so as Amelia in the background works real hard to chase maybe a slightly still living salmon. Um, yeah, it's, you know, we can look at the cub chewing, chewing on fish and it's, it's harder for them. I think not only because they're smaller, so it's just probably harder to chew the fish, especially if they're getting into any bony material, but also they don't have the, the full complement of teeth that an adult bear will. Kind of like Otis. That's right. And um, bears in many different places catching fish right now. So we have Amelia downstream of the falls. We we're just looking at her, another bear upstream of the falls, scavenging a, a dead and dying salmon. Um, Charlie, I know that you uh, wanted to talk about Otis this year and his sort of story of success and, um, and what, you know, that bear specifically means to, to people around the world. I know you had some thoughts on that. Well, I, I, Otis never ceases to amaze me. I mean, he came out yesterday at five o'clock and was out through the night again hunting. And if you read the community, the love and adoration of this bear is like nothing I've seen. I, I'd be curious what the community thinks, but I think next year it'd be fun just to have a dedicated camera for Otis, Otis TV, because there's something very mystical about Otis that captures the heart of everyone. As you know, as part of Fat Bear Week, we, should, we used to do it the week after. We created the Otis Fund. I like to think it was a Lifetime Achievement Award. How does a bear in one week, I think we've raised over $207,000. I mean, I can't explain that. Uh, it, one, explains the love for Otis. Two, the love for the rangers in Katmai. But three, it really underscores the magic of the Explore community. I, I, it's a, I, I'd like to just you know, take that moment and stop and thank everyone. It's, it's a number that's beyond my wildest dreams. I, I, I don't even understand it. I can't fathom it. And it's really a testament to the community and this beloved bear. We could speak about Otis all the time. I mean, I, it'd be more fun to do that live and have a microphone. I'd love to hear from everyone about what it is that why this bear captures everyone's heart so much. But as someone who likes to post him on social media and watch him, it just people can't get enough of OT, the king, the Fisher King, the Zen master. But the Otis Fund, uh, you know, we have a matching grant. The Explore team came to me this year and said, let's do a Fat Bear Week. I actually thought it was a mistake. Um, there's nothing like it in the world. And if there is, please share it where. And this bear in particular, Otis, you know, he single-handedly, uh, look at the attention that he's drawing to the Katmai Conservancy. I mean, over $200,000 in one week. And there's not like a gimmick where it's like, get a t-shirt, get an autograph, get a trip to Katmai. This is coming out of the hearts of just the best community on the planet, explore.org. It just humbles me and Otis is a symbol of that. And it's another conversation, you know, maybe I'll just do one day just with our fans, but I, I love to learn more about what it is about Otis that rings true in all of our hearts. And I know this year we were very nervous with him coming late and bony and somehow this bear perseveres and he's patient. And like, even with Fat Bear Week, he didn't interrupt Brazier's coronation, and then at night he reappears. <laughs> it's, it's like there's something going on here, and it's just, it's such an honor. And, you know, originally when we did this talk, Mike, it was really about, oh, let's talk about the Otis, the Otis Fund and the Challenge Grant, but I didn't think it was possible to raise the amount we had. And, and I saw now I'm just going to take it to say we all have so much to celebrate and to thank each and every one of our fans who are just so selfless and Otis and you, Naomi and Mike, and to my staff, they work so endlessly and tirelessly to do it. It's, 
there's nothing like it in the world. Nothing like Katmai and nothing like Explore.org and these bears and Otis. And if there is, please tell me where, and maybe we can bring them into the family because I'd mm -hmm. love to know. Otis, we, you know, I, maybe people can put it on the community comments now. I mean, if, is that a crazy idea? Just have a camera follow Otis next year? This is Otis, <laughs> dedicated. You know, I, Otis is, think, is I mean, he's such an on. inspiration, Charlie, right? I mean, he's, he's patience, right? His skill at, at fishing. I mean, when he came back this year, he was he was skinnier and more frail than we've ever seen him and he just he just knew how to do it he knew how to fish he knew how to do what he had to do which is get fat enough to survive and i just think that's that's so inspiring and i think that you know we rangers i think people who watch the cams are inspired by that and um you know, when in camp, the day Otis came back, you could hear cheers along the bridge. People excited because Otis had come back. <clears throat> yeah, it's really, it's, it's a story of the ages. And in his turnaround this year, I mean, obviously he's not a fat pair champ, but that first week or two, and he started working nights, 24 hours and taking those patented naps on the riverbank it's incredible because I, I would read the audience's comments and people were really worried. One, he showed up late Two, he was so bony and look at him now. And it's, it's truly, you know, so it's incredible. And, and then he's also probably the world's foremost animal philanthropist. I mean, Otis has raised over 200,000 this week. So I don't think there's any animal like that out there. He is the king for a reason, and you know, it just, just amazing. I, 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 I can't say enough. I, I'm, I'm so happy he's with us as we speak. And even last night, like he timed it. It was Grazer's moment. He knew it. And then it felt like after the coordination, he showed back up to the office, and then he was working at night all night again. Ever, what is that? That battery that just keeps going incredible <laughs> so yeah, to, it's to me it really speaks to the the power of um or the the level of emotional connections that people can make with individual animals and that i think is something that um like conservation biologists have not caught on to very quickly um, and you look at conservation biology, it was very much focused on populations, which is extraordinarily important mm -hmm. because you need healthy populations, you need genetic diversity, you can't just like conserve a species with one individual animal. Uh, but it's the stories of these individual animals that people connect with and resonate, um, resonate with. And that I think that energy that, and that emotion transfers to a love of the species overall. So when you have, you know, bears like Amelia, you have bears like Otis. Um, and every other individual bear on Brooks River, I mean, each one of these bears has fans and admirers. Um, and, and I think if, um, if we can learn to use, you know, the stories of individual animals uh, strongly, like, you know, and, and let them sort of showcase their own stories like Otis has done, then I think, um, you know, more people will appreciate and, and want to care for uh, the landscapes that, that support these animals. Yeah. No, it's, it's, and, and to support it's, the landscapes that they people live in too, right? I mean, I may not have bears where I live in Massachusetts, but I have osprey, and I, you know, and there there are creatures around here that um, when you get to know the individual birds in your backyard, or um, you know, you 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 care for them a lot, and I think these bear knowing these bears helps us understand that. Oh, for sure. And, you know, uh, learning to watch bears as individuals, uh, that's something that Brooks River taught me. And it's fundamentally changed sort of my, my wildlife watching experiences. 
Um, I, you know, if I see like a moose in the wild or a deer, or I, uh, you know, in my area, if I'm lucky enough to see a black bear, that's not uh, just a bear. It is one of the bears, one of the many bears doing its own unique things. Um, so, oh, I encourage people, yeah, to get to know animals, try to think about that on a deeper level. And I think a lot of indigenous cultures have been doing that for a long, long time. Um, but it's, it hasn't been, you know, maybe something that's, that's carried over into a lot of the, you know, um, you know, quote unquote, Western cultures or, or philosophies. But I think we have that opportunity to do that through things like webcams and, um, and careful observation of animals elsewhere. Like if you go to Yellowstone and you set up a spotting scope and watch wolves, you're not going to see just wolves. You're going to see individual wolves doing very different things. Um, so, and it, it makes a, I think for a richer wildlife watching experience. You know, there, there was one, about, there was, go ahead, Charlie. No, go ahead. No, no, no. I, I was sidetracked. Please keep going. No, I, I was just going to say that I had, a, um, one, one Saturday evening and I, I was at the falls and, um, I'd say 90% of the people on the platform at that, that evening were bear cam watchers. And it made for the most amazing viewing experience because people weren't just, oh, I've got to get this picture of a bear, but everyone was watching the behaviors of the bears and, and understanding that in the context of each individual bear. And so Mike, when you say it changes the bear, you know, the wildlife viewing experience, I think, you know, that was such a great example of that to me. And, and it, was a, it was just a magical evening um, at the falls to have that group there all watching and, and looking at the bears as individuals and their individual behaviors. You know, I'm uh, reading some of the comments in the community about the Otis cam and the idea uh -oh. of stringing together <laughs> a compilation. And I, I think it's a wonderful idea. And, I just want to reiterate that's as much as I am going to talk about the bears and the other live camps and the connection to the nature. It's this community at Explore that is the cherry on the Sunday. And I just love reading that. And yes, we will try to string together at Otis compilation over the years. And um, that's what I'm saying. I mean, I some nights if I can't sleep or anything and I'm watching bear cam, it's just as much fun to read the passion that exists on our community. And again, to everyone, thank you for donating to the Otis Fund. Um, you know, no one has to. I, I realize that times have been tough and it just shows the selfless nature of everyone. It's it's truly one of the great feats. I, I, I don't take it lightly to see this community to do that, but your presence watching the cams, learning, loving, growing. That's really the, the, the gold bar at Explore. So thank you for the cherry on the Sunday. I just want to say that before we close, because originally I thought we were talking, I was going to talk about the Otis Bum, but it's already exceeded my wildest expectations. So I'm in celebratory mode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, and it, yeah, and the, the donations to the Otis Fund as well have, um, they are extraordinarily important for Katmai National Park. And you think about a park like Katmai that is so remote that doesn't have a large physical visitation like um, Yellowstone or Yosemite or Acadia or Great Smoky Mountains. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's harder for people um, to connect with a place that's so remote that not many people visit in person. The webcams are fundamentally changing. The experience and the, um, there's probably no other national park with a staff as small as Katmai, permanent staff, like year round employees, probably like 25 to 30 at most. And, uh, you know, to, to have every year some, uh, you know, collectively the, the public donating a few hundred thousand dollars to the park, I mean, that's off the charts levels of success. So yeah, thanks to everybody who has um, donated um, and, and shown that generosity. I always like to reiterate though, that if you can't donate specifically, there's many ways to help brown bears uh, and salmon, you know, you want to support sustainable fisheries uh, no matter what. So just don't buy a fish, check to see where that fish came from and make sure that it was um, harvested, 
harvested sustainably if you eat fish. Uh, there's the opportunity to share bears and salmon in the webcams with other people, because the more people that are aware of this, the better. And, um, and then also, yeah, you know, you can vote uh, for people who want to protect these landscapes and who will work uh, to do that, especially, you know, regarding things like climate change. So thanks to everybody who has shown support for Katmai now and in the past and in the future. Before we um, conclude today, um, you know, we just got finished with our, our biggest event of the year. Uh, do we want to talk about Fat Bear Week and what a success that was? Naomi, um, you know, maybe just give us a brief rundown of how it started and how it ended. Well, goodness. Well, we started um, with Fat Bear Junior uh, competition and oh, right. um <laughs> how right? could i forget how could you forget um so those little tubby guys um 806 junior won and um, moved on to the big bracket and um so we started out with um um the cub and the sub adults and and moms and um i mean I think the bracket this year was full of great stories and it showed how different bears can find success in different ways on the Brooks River. And we need to celebrate that. And I think voters recognize that this year. I mean, they didn't necessarily vote for the biggest guys. They, they, I think the stories carried a lot of the votes. And I think also it was the year of the sow. In the semifinals, three out of the four semifinalists were sows. And um, I think that says something. I think that's uh, some recognition of the, the hard work that um, female bears have to do as moms, although it was a single sow that won. And, uh, and that was 128 Grazer. She was the gutsy gal who beat the guy with the gut. 32 chunk. So congratulations to 128 Grazer. Chunk was a giant. Um, and I think his before and after photos were really compelling this year. And that's why he garnered a lot of votes. But yeah, Grazer did really well for herself this summer. He had um, both these bears have great stories to consider about life and survival and the competition that they face. Um, and, uh, and Grazer had a ton of fans this year. And I think maybe that's why, um, you know, she carried the vote so well. Uh, Charlie, uh, what did you think of Fat Bear Week? Was this a, a surprise outcome for you? I had a feeling it was going to be um, Grazer and Chunk. It's amazing each year, like Fat Bear Week's a tough one for me because I get emotionally connected to some of my own bears. So I will, you know, and I see them go down and I have to remind myself that they don't care. Like only we care. <laughs> They're right. so happy. They're fat. They go to sleep, but I get emotionally uh, connected. I had a funny feeling, um, you know, reading always comments that Grazer has been such a warrior queen for princess, whatever, for so long with those three. I'm hoping we're going to see some offspring again. And, you know, you could just tell it was, you know, the year of the woman. I'm wearing the t shirt right there now of a Grazer girl power t shirt. Um, I like you, Mike. I was in awe of Chunk. Uh, his size, I, I, I just couldn't believe how big he became. I, I was in awe, but I knew that this wasn't a year about the physical size. There was something that Grazer was channeling, and she also was ginormous, and she deserved it. This bear has proven to be, you know, to hold her ground against the biggest alpha males out there, and. It's, you know, girl power this year and Grazer's a fitting queen. And I'm still hoping that rumor of 747 and Grazer, because I want that would be one incredible <laughs> offspring. I want to be a part of that. You know, uh, if I see some massive little ones coming next year, I'm going to just call it because I know, you know, 747, he's a charmer. He likes, you know, he likes to, he likes to court. I know that I made a little film on him. So. That would be wonderful. And Holly, let's also talk about Holly and how beautiful she looked in 901. And like you said, three of the four bears 
you know, 747 is still to me just incredibly magnificent. But I have to remind myself, that's the beauty of this competition. Like I get emotional that these bears back to patient, perseverance, calm, they don't care. They're just happy they've been fed and they'll go off to their deads. They don't need trophies or anything. And so it was a great fat bear week. 1.3 million votes, Mike, I heard. So 300,000, not 300,000, yeah. 300,000 more votes than last year in the streams. And it's just a testament again to the great work that you, Naomi, the staff, the Cap My, the staff at Explore do. You know, I'm just a fan, but really it all belongs to you guys. And thank you for an incredible season. I'm not calling it over because we still got bears and we got another month. And I know I'll be looking at all the photos and posting, but Fat Bear Week was incredible again and i know a lot of people are truly happy about grazer you know it was her time yeah it was it was a great week a lot of work thanks everybody who did vote um i know yeah it's a deep breath that we all take after fat bear week is over if you're on the our side of things that is but it was wonderful to see um everybody everybody you know fall in love with the event um one more time and yeah like you said charlie we still have bears to watch over the next uh, few weeks here at brooks river so i encourage people to tune into the live cams uh with uh limited sunlight at this time of the year in this part of alaska the viewing hours are going to be less than what we have in the middle of summer so we don't have 24 7 cams right now but we have still really uh, many great bear watching opportunities at Brooks River. So continue to watch the bears, look for mothers and their cubs uh, up and down uh, Brooks River. Uh, and and uh, I want to thank uh, you both today for uh, for joining us. It's, it's, um, it's been fun uh, to talk with the both of you and, and share your experiences about the summer and what we've been seeing on the cams live today as well. So Charlie, thanks for being here. Always a pleasure. Never stop learning. And uh, thank again, thank you all so much. And Naomi, uh, yeah, thanks for, for being here and sharing your expertise. Oh, my pleasure. And I just want to give a shout out to my fellow um, rangers who worked so tirelessly on Fat Bear Week, and that's Ranger Felicia and Ranger Chris. And there were other rangers and other people at the park who, who helped us out. But, um, you know, the uh, Fat Bear Week team, you know, I got to give a shout out to them because it was it was it was great and it was a lot of work. Well, continue to watch the bears. Um, you'll you know, your observations um, in your uh, everyone <clears throat> of everybody watching the cameras helps us learn as well. Thanks for being here uh, and joining us today for this play by play broadcast. My name is Mike Fitz with Explore.org. I was jo I joined today by my co-host. Uh, Katmai National Park Ranger Naomi Boak and Explore.org's founder, Charlie Annenberg. Until we talk to you again, enjoy the bear cams. And as uh, Charlie likes to say, never stop learning.